very good evening to all of you uh, at the outset i wish the resource person professor sb varkana sir and uh, all my team members dr irfan abbas mr srinivas rao mr nagraj ms vaisnavi and all the participants a very happy new year 2022 and in continuation of our two earlier weekly online lectures today we have the lecture on international legal regime of intellectual property rights by uh, eminent professor of international law professor sb varkana uh, and uh, you know very well that uh, intellectual property rights always have an international dimension because they are transnational in nature therefore the international legal aspects have to be understood by one and all professor varkana graduated in law from university college of law usman university hyderabad completed his master's degree in llm in law llm with specialization in international law in the year 1989 and completed phd that is doctor of philosophy on uh, exclusive economic zone which is an important part of the law of the sea in 1994 sir has published number of articles on uh, various topics of law in standard law journals and attended more than 20 national and international seminars and also presented you know papers in various conferences and uh, professor varkana has been a resource person at several national seminars workshops and ugc refresher courses and also the keynote speaker in uh, many workshops and seminars sir has been a guest faculty at international center for alternative dispute resolution icadr hyderabad ap police academy dr marich nrd institute for good governance at uh, hyderabad and andhra pradesh human resources development institute at papatla andhra pradesh he has been invited as a judge for international moot court competition such as philip jessup stetson and henry dunant and sir is an associate member of the indian society of international law new delhi and a life member of the center for advanced american studies hyderabad on the administrative side sir has a very rich experience having worked initially as the vice principal of university college of law then as the principal of the same college where he studied and he also discharged duties in several capacities in the university administration then he worked as professor of law in department of law usman university hyderabad and uh, sir was invited by the athens institute for education and research greece to speak at their annual international conference on law in july 2014 on the topic minority rights protection in india and greece a comparative study of recent developments in july 2015 again professor varkana presented a paper titled living relationship vanishing point of institution of marriage organized by the same Athens Institute for Education and Research Greece sir visited Seoul South Korea to attend a conference on peace he has been chairperson board of studies in law Usman University member general council of Nalsar University of law dean faculty of law of law of Mahatma Gandhi University Nalgonda then he worked as the head department of law Usman University He was a co-convener of PS Law Set and PGL Set 2017, and the convener of PS Law Set, that is PS Law Common Entrance Test and PG Law Common Entrance Test in 2018. Sir joined 
Symbiosis International University as professor and head center for research and publications for a brief period of one year. Presently, Professor Dwarakana is working as the principal of Pendekanti Law College, Hyderabad. On the whole, Sir possesses a cumulative experience of 32 years in teaching and researching in the field of law and 18 years of administrative experience. So, dear participants, I present Professor Varkana with very vast experience in the field of international law, intellectual property rights, and exposure to prestigious institutions like Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, and many others. I don't want to stand between you and the resource person. Now I request <laughs> Professor Sripati Dwarakana, sir, to uh, present his lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, also a very good evening to my friend and uh, co-host, uh, Dr. G.B. Reddy. Coming to the very topic today, that is International Regime of IPR, an overview. I am going to speak on the various conventions, treaties, and agreements that have been signed in the field of IPR in the international community. In other words, this particular law applies to all the countries, the treaties, conventions, and uh, also the organizations. Some organizations are also parties to certain treaties and conventions. So these uh, conventions in the field of IPR are applicable to all these organizations also. <clears throat> now, <coughs> coming to the international legal regime. A few conventions have been signed a long time ago. In fact, the very first convention that was signed, since there is a lot of international trade among the countries in the world today, and uh, trade particularly related to intellectual property has given rise to a lot of disputes among the countries as well as disputes among individuals belonging to different countries. <laughs> and uh, in this background, the international legal regime has assumed great importance and significance because it consists of all the requisite, in other words, you can say the required treaties, conventions and agreements, uh, which can <clears throat> solve the kind of disputes that come into existence. Uh, the reason why the treaties and conventions have assumed so much of importance and significance in the world today, as I stated earlier, is because of the uh, conventions consisting of provisions which are uh, not so effective. And uh, there have been instances where uh, people have uh, belonging to different countries, nationals of different countries have violated or rather infringed the intellectual property rights of uh, the owners of the IPR. So, uh, uh, trade the, and so commerce in any commodity takes place on a global platform and therefore intellectual property is no exception to this. Like <clears throat> all other trade in different commodities, intellectual property also has become a part of trade and commerce. And uh, looking at the intellectual property and trade 
it is very important for us to understand the legal regime that governs intellectual property and also the protection that is accorded to this intellectual property because this regime acts as a base for all international trade in the world it is not only international but national of intellectual property now as i stated earlier the very first convention that was signed in the field of intellectual property has been the paris convention for the protection of industrial property signed in 1883 now this convention is considered to be a landmark convention merely because of the fact that it is the first of its kind that has been signed in the field of intellectual property and uh, since it was the first convention all the intellectual properties that were in existence at that point of time that is in 1883 uh, were brought under the broad umbrella of this convention uh, that is the paris convention applies to industrial property in the widest sense uh, that includes patents trademarks industrial designs utility models a kind of small scale patent that is utility models many people uh, uh, do not know but in certain countries it is a kind of a small scale patent that is provided by the laws of some countries so it is known as a utility model in other ways other words it is a kind of a patent but uh, somewhat uh, smaller in nature now apart from the above it also protects service marks trade names designations under which an industrial or commercial activity is carried out and uh, geographical indications which indicates the source and appellations of origin and also the repression of unfair competition so you can see from this that uh, broad uh, uh, categories of intellectual properties have been brought under the convention because it was the first convention subsequently several conventions were signed for each intellectual property uh, for example you can see the bern convention that was signed in 1886 and then we have a uh, Uh, madrid agreement madrid convention on trademarks and uh, the rome convention on neighboring rights so for every kind of intellectual property separate and individual conventions were signed but that was subsequent to this convention because this was the first convention now this convention has uh, what you say uh, incorporated certain very important principles for example the principle of national treatment has been uh, one of the most important principles that have been introduced by the paris convention for the first time now, the substantive provisions of the convention fall into three main categories that is national treatment right of priority and certain common rules now under the provisions of national treatment of this principle of national treatment has been the cornerstone of the paris convention and uh, all the subsequent conventions that have been signed in the field of ipr and also those conventions outside the field of ipr have incorporated this principle of national treatment now the question is what is this principle of national treatment the convention provides that as regards the protection of industrial property each contracting state must grant the same protection to nationals of other contracting states that it grants to its own nationals because uh, uh, since intellectual property has an international character it is not enough for an owner of intellectual property if he can protect his property within the boundaries of his country it is necessary for him to protect his intellectual property on the territories of other countries also so when he applies for protection on the territories of other countries 
countries which have signed the paris convention are under an obligation to provide the same protection to the foreigner applying for his ip protection in that country in the sense in a gist the principle of national treatment speaks of equal treatment between citizens and foreigners now the domestic law of a country may provide certain rights and privileges to the citizens then these rights and privileges that the domestic law provides to the citizens must be extended to the foreigners also when they apply for intellectual property protection on the territory of that country this is what the principle of national treatment speaks of now this principle of national treatment also is a far reaching principle in the sense even nationals of non contracting states are entitled to national treatment under the convention so it is not necessary that only nationals of the contracting states are given protection even nationals of states which are not contracting states shall be given national treatment under the convention but with a rider a condition that is if these nationals are domiciled that is if they have a residence or have a real and effective industrial or commercial establishment on the territory of a contracting state so for protection under the principle of national treatment three criteria are have been laid down by the convention one is a person should be a national of a contracting state if is not a national of a contracting state he should be domiciled or have residence on the territory of a contracting state thirdly if he has an industrial or commercial establishment on the territory of a contracting state then he shall be given protection under national treatment so this principle of national treatment has uh, a been the foundation stone of the paris convention then the next important feature of the paris convention is the uh, right of priority particularly in the case of patents and utility models wherever these utility models exist on the territories of countries then marks and industrial designs now this right means that on the basis of a regular first application filed in one of the contracting states the applicant may within a certain period of time that is 12 months for patents and 6 months for utility models sorry 12 months for patents and utility models and 6 months for industrial designs and marks apply for protection in any of the other contracting states so suppose i file for my patent protection today in india then if i am applying for a patent and in the case of a country is national who is applying for a utility model he is given or i am given 12 months time to sub uh, what you submit my application on the territories of other countries for the grant of a patent and in the case of industrial designs and marks to be protected the period is 6 months now these subsequent applications that is the first application is filed today and the subsequent applications that are being filed on the territories of other countries will be regarded as if they had been filed on the same day as the first application that is it is deemed that now today is january 1 2022 i file for an application for the grant of a patent in india subsequently i might file an application in february march april may two two applications in different countries but wherever and in uh, whatever number of countries that i file my application the filing of the application shall be deemed to be filed on the same day that is january 1 2022 so that is the significance of the right of priority that is granted by the paris convention so these two uh, concepts have given the paris convention a lot of uh, significance okay now the convention lays down 
a few common rules that all contracting states must follow. That is, all states that are parties to the convention must follow. Uh, the most important ones are in the case of patents. Patents granted in different contracting states for the same invention are independent of each other. Now, when I say that the patents are independent of each other, it means that if a country has granted a patent and the country is a party to the Paris Convention, then it does not obligate other contracting states to grant a patent. A patent cannot be refused, annulled or terminated in any contracting state on the ground that it has been refused or annulled or has terminated in any other contracting state. Now, if one country has granted a patent, it does not mean that all the other countries are under an obligation to grant the patent because those countries have their own domestic laws. So if the patent application is technically right and the applicant fulfills all the conditions, nothing prevents those countries from granting a patent. But in case the application does not fulfill all the technicalities, those countries have every right to refuse. Similarly, a contracting state cannot refuse a patent or annul a patent or terminate a patent on the ground that the patent application has been refused or annulled or has terminated in any other contracting state. Now, if a patent application is rejected by one country, the other country shall not follow this country and say, since that country has rejected the application, we will also reject. If the application is correct in all ways, it fulfills all the technicalities, the country is under an obligation to grant a patent because the granting of patents are independent of one another. One country does not, uh, grant of patent by one country does not depend upon the grant of patent by another country. So this is also a very uh, important uh, provision or you can say a salient feature of the Paris Convention. Then uh, the inventor has a right to be named in the patent as per the provisions of the convention. Inventor has a complete right to be named in the patent as the inventor. Now, the grant of a patent may not be refused and a patent may not be invalidated on the ground that the sale of a patented product or of a product obtained by means of the patented process is subject to restrictions or limitations resulting from the domestic law. Now, suppose a patent has been granted in one country and certain products are manufactured through the working of that patented inv invention. Now, this product which has been obtained by means of a patented process, if it is subject to certain restrictions or limitations that are imposed by the domestic law of a country shall not uh, the applicant shall not be refused the grant of a patent in another country and the patent also shall not be invalidated on the ground that the sale of the patent product or of a product obtained by means of the patented process is subject to restrictions or limitations resulting from the domestic law. So this is also a common rule, which is uh, part of the Paris Convention. Now, compulsory license is also a very important uh, feature of the Paris Convention. And uh, the question is, what is meant by compulsory licensing? Suppose a person has invented a machine, uh, which, is, which uh, satisfies the triple test. Now, he applies for a grant of a patent and a patent is granted to him after the due procedure 
uh, that is followed by the concerned authority. Now, suppose the patent holder does not work the invention. The purpose of a patent being granted to an inventor by the concerned authority is that the patent holder must work the invention, produce or manufacture products for the public for the public and he should also sell it as a at a reasonable price. This is the purpose. Suppose the inventor sits on the patent and uh, for a long time does not work the patent despite having a patent. So if after an expiry of three years from the date of the grant of the patent, any third party who is aware that a certain patent holder has been sitting on his patent and not working it, then he can apply to the concerned authority for the grant of a compulsory license. So uh, stating that the patent right holder has not worked the invention for a period of three years. So he is kind of abusing the patent right. Now, the concerned authority shall not immediately grant a compulsory license to the third party. It shall first send a notice to the patent holder seeking a reply from him as to why he has not worked the invention despite a patent being granted to him. Now, if the patent holder uh, gives valid reasons as to why he could not work the invention, then the concerned authority, if satisfied by the reasons given by the patent holder, shall not grant a compulsory license. Now the question is, what could be valid reasons? Because uh, a patent holder cannot give any reason that he likes. And uh, the concerned authority also shall not accept every reason that is given by a uh, patent holder for not working the invention. There are certain reasons. For example, uh, a patent holder may say that uh, he was trying for a financial partner because to work the patented invention, you need infrastructure, you need machinery, and you need other uh, uh, what you say, items, and for that you need money. So he, he can always tell the concerned authority that he has been trying to find a financial partner for working the invention, and since he did not find, it has taken so much of time. That is a valid reason. And secondly, if he has been, uh, if he has met with an accident, has been hospitalized, and then uh, certain complications follow, and he was not in a position to work the invention. Now, these are said to be valid reasons which the concerned authority may accept. So, under such circumstances, the concerned authority may not grant a compulsory license. But if the concerned authority is not satisfied by the reasons given by the patent holder, then it shall grant a compulsory license to the uh, third party. Uh, asking the third party to work the patented invention and to produce goods for the public good. So that is what uh, uh, compulsory license is. Coming to the next important uh, uh, provision of the Paris Convention is with regard to Marx. Uh, what we should understand is that uh, treaties, conventions and agreements shall never be country specific because the laws, the domestic laws of the countries vary from one another. So it becomes highly impossible for any treaty to satisfy the conditions that are laid down by the domestic laws. So normally all conventions, treaties and agreements laid on broad guidelines. And the countries that are parties to these treaties and conventions must incorporate those broad, broad guidelines and 
the treaties and conventions also give discretion to the contracting parties to make changes in the domestic law in whatever manner they like uh, to suit the circumstances existing in their territories. So with regard to Marx also, uh, the Paris Convention does not regulate the conditions in respect of filing and registration of Marx. Similar to the grant of a patent, we have seen that uh, the, one of the important features of the Paris Convention is the independence of patents. Similarly, in the case of uh, registration of mark also, uh, one mark that is protected in one country is independent of a mark protected in another country. There is no link between the protection granted to a mark on the territories of two different countries. Uh, it is very clear from this provision that assuming that a particular mark which is held by a certain person is protected in 15 countries. Now two countries may annul the mark on some uh, for some reason or the other. It does not mean that all the other countries also shall annul the protection given to the mark because two other countries have annulled the protection of the mark. Because protection of the mark on the territories of different countries are independent of one another. So if a mark fulfills the conditions and uh, all the technicalities are uh, followed by the applicant, then uh, nothing prevents the countries from granting protection to his mark. So a mark, when it is filed in the country of origin, then the form in which it is filed in its country of origin must also be accepted in its original form in the other contracting states. Now, registration may be refused in certain well-defined cases. For example, if the mark uh, is devoid of distinctive character, that is one of the essential requisites for the protection of a mark. It must have a distinctive character and it should not be contrary or uh, contrary to morality or public order and where if the mark if granted protection would infringe the acquired rights of third parties and uh, where if a mark resembles the national flags uh, of any country or countries and uh, if a mark has a resemblance with the armorial bearings of countries for instance in India uh, uh, the army has a certain uh, insignia the air force and the navy so these armorial bearings, if the mark has a resemblance, it shall be rejected. So a lot of restrictions have been imposed on the protection that would be granted in respect of a mark. Next, coming to collective marks. Collective marks must also be granted protection. Then we have industrial designs, which is also covered under the Paris Convention and then trade names and indications of source. So this condition shall not uh, deny the owner of an industrial design uh, from being uh, seeking protection for his industrial design. Coming to trade names, protection must be granted to trade names in each contracting state without there being an obligation to file or register the names. So when trade names, uh, applications are filed for the protection of trade names in each contracting state, uh, without there being an obligation to file or register the names. Now, the question is, what is a trade name? Now, we have various examples. For example, if you take uh, Honda, car manufacturer. Honda is the trade name. And what is the mark? The H Honda trademark. Similarly, for Tata, Tata is the trade name and the trademark of T. Similarly, in Toyota, then Hyundai, 
So there is a trademark and there is a trade name. So trademarks and trade names shall be equally protected, belonging to companies on the territories of different countries, as far as the provisions of the Paris Convention is concerned. Then indications of source. Now measures must be taken by each contracting state against direct or indirect use of a false indication of a source of goods or the identity of the producer, manufacturer or trader. Now this is what in recent times uh, we know as geographical indications. But the Paris Convention in the year 1883 itself has uh, incorporated this indications of source. So a product is identified with the place from where it originates or the place where it, from where it is manufactured. And therefore, the product is protected. We have many examples. For instance, you can speak of Scotch whiskey because it comes from Scotland. It is protected. Then Indian examples, Basmati rice because it comes from the northern part of India. It is protected under geographical indications. And there are so many other examples of uh, uh, products coming from a particular area being protected under geographical indications. In India itself, we have so many examples, like you have uh, Pochampali saris and then uh, Pondapalli toys are also protected under geographical indications. So these are some of the examples of uh, products being uh, protected uh, on the basis of the uh, place from where they originate. That is why it is known as indications of source or geographical indications. Now the last part of the Paris Convention deals with unfair competition. Now, each contracting state must provide for effective protection against unfair competition. The Paris Union has laid down certain provisions to curb and prevent unfair competition. And uh, it is an obligation on the part of the states that are parties to the Paris Convention to make provisions within their domestic law to ensure that effective protection is provided to intellectual property rights holders against unfair competition. Now, the, all the countries together that have signed the Paris Convention constitute the Paris Union. So this Paris Union is established by the Convention and it has an assembly and an executive committee. Every state that is a member of the Union and has adhered to at least the administrative and final provisions of the Stockholm Act 1967 is a member of the assembly. So all the states that are parties to the Convention automatically are uh, a member of the assembly, which is an important organ of the Paris uh, Union. Now, the members of the executive committee are elected from among the members of the Union, except for Switzerland. Switzerland is an exception because it is a member ex officio. And uh, the convention is open to all states. Instruments of ratification or accession must be deposited with the Director General of WIPO. Even today, there are many states which are not parties to the Paris Convention, but the Convention is open to all those states, even today, if they want to become members of the Paris Convention. The next important convention in the field of intellectual property is the Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works that has been signed in the year 1886. And, uh, in those days, uh, there were a lot of disputes in respect of literary works and also artistic works, particularly between England and France. Uh, persons who have literary works or who have published books in England, these books were copied by French and uh, 
French authors who wrote some excellent works were copied by the British writers. And this gave rise to the Anglo-Saxon disputes in respect of copyright. So the Berne Convention was signed for the protection of literary and artistic works. So it deals with the rights of the authors and also the protection of the works. It is based on three basic principles and also contains a series of provisions determining the minimum protection to be granted as well as certain special provisions available to developing countries that want to make use of them. Now the three, three basic principles are the following. First is works originating in one of the contracting states. That is works of the author of which uh, the work, the author of which is a national of such a state or works which first published in such a state must be given the same protection in each of the other contracting states as the latter grants to the works of its own nationals. That is, the Berne Convention also falls, uh, follows the principle of national treatment. That is, when foreigners apply for protection on the territory of a country for the protection of their works, then that country must provide the same protection to the foreigners' works which the country provides to its own nationals. So principle of national treatment is very much a part of the Berne Convention. Then secondly, protection must not be conditional upon compliance with any formality. That is when protection is being sought by the owner of a work or the author of a work on the territories of countries then this protection must not be made conditional upon compliance with any formality. It is principle of automatic protection. It will ensure that the works are protected on the territories of all the countries without any uh, setbacks. Now, thirdly, protection is independent of the existence of protection in the country of origin of the work. Now, if a work is protected in a country from where the work has originated and uh, other countries can refuse protection just because the country of origin has protected the work it does not mean that other countries are under an obligation to provide protection to that work similarly where if a work is not granted protection in the country of origin that shall not be a bar for the work not to be protected on the territories of other countries because it is the principle of independence of protection as we have seen in the case of patents independence of patents similarly here also it is independence of protection however a contracting state provides for a longer term of protection than the minimum prescribed by the convention and the work ceases to be protected in the country of origin, then protection may be denied once protection in the country of origin ceases. Now, this is a very interesting provision in the sense, so let us assume a country provides 50 years protection for a work in the country of origin, and another country may provide 60 years of protection. That is longer than the protection that is granted by the country of origin. But where if the protection in the country of origin ceases, the day on which the protection ceases, the protection in the other country also will cease, irrespective of the fact that the country offers a longer period of protection. Uh, the Berne Convention lays down certain minimum standards of protection that relate to the works and rights to be protected and to the duration of protection. Now, what are the works that are protected by the Berne Convention? When we speak of literary works, it means books, then uh, that is novels, poems, and then uh, even pamphlets are protected. 
because uh, it is an intellectual creation. And there are so many other literary works. For instance, uh, anthologies. Anthology is a collection of poems. And then we have encyclopedias. Now, uh, you might ask a question as to how an anthology, which is a collection of poems, is original. Because one of the requisite conditions for protection for pop of uh, a work under copyright is that the work must be original. So, in an anthology, though it is a collection, what is protected is the method used by the author of the anthology in compiling the poems and then putting the poems in a systematic manner. That effort of the author is protected. Similarly, in the case of encyclopedia also, because encyclopedia is also a collection. Then coming to artistic works, you have sculpture, engraving, and uh, so many the art, so many uh, paintings, sketches, maps. They're all protected under uh, what you say copyright, like uh, dramatic or musical works, dramatic works, and then films are protected under copyright. Now, subject to certain allowed reservations, limitations or exceptions, the following are among the rights that must be recognized as exclusive rights of authorization. That is where if a copyright is granted to the owner. Then, the exclusive right to translate is given to the owner, the right to make adaptations and arrangements of the work, the right to perform in public, dramatic, dramatic or musical and musical works, the right to recite literary works in public, the right to communicate to the public the performance of such works, the right to broadcast with the possibility that a contracting state may provide for a mere right to equitable remuneration instead of right of authorization. So these are the various rights that have been given or conferred upon a copyright owner. That is why it is always said that a copyright is nothing but a bundle of rights. Then next air fan. Then the right to make reproductions, the right to use the work as a basis for an audiovisual work. Now, apart from all these rights, the convention also provides for moral rights. Now, what is a moral right? Moral right is the right of an author or the work that a person has authored shall be protected even after the death of the author. Even after the death of the author, his work will shall be protected. That is a moral right that has been granted by the Berne Convention on the authors of uh, literary and artistic works. And uh, coming to the protection, the duration of protection of the uh, works, uh, different works have different durations of protection. For example, in literary works, it is life of the author and 50 years after his death. And uh, in the case of uh, photographic works, it is uh, uh, half the duration and uh, exceptions there are certain exceptions to this uh, what you say duration of protection that is life of the author and 50 years after his death in the case of anonymous or pseudonymous works the term of protection expires 50 years after the work has been lawfully made available to the public except if the pseudonym leaves no doubt as to the author's identity or if the author discloses his or her identity during that period. In the latter case, the general rule applies. In the case of cinematographic works, the minimum term of protection is 50 years after making the work available to the public or failing such an event from the creation of the work. In the case of works of applied art and photographic works, the minimum term is 25 years from the creation of the work. So, as I've said, uh, different categories of works have different kinds of uh, durations of protection under the Berne Convention. The Berne Convention also lays down certain, uh, what you say, exceptions 
to the copyright in the sense uh, now works which are used for educational purposes though may be reproduced but it shall not amount to infringement of the copyright now it is very clear these limitations are commonly referred to as free uses of protected works and are set forth in articles 9 clause 2 that is reproduction of certain special cases then in article 10 quotations and use of works by way of illustration for teaching purposes then 10 bis reproduction of newspaper or similar articles and use of works for the purpose of reporting current events and 11 bis class 3 ephemeral recordings for broadcasting purposes so these are the exceptions when protected works are used shall not constitute or amount to infringement of copyright similar to the paris convention the burn union also has an assembly and executive committee and every country that is a member of the union and has other to at least the administrative and final provisions of the stockholm act is a member of the assembly the members of the executive committee are elected from among the members of the union except for switzerland which is a member of ex officio of uh, the burn union the convention is open to all states instruments of ratification or accession must be deposited with the director general of ipo now madrid agreement is also a very important component of the international regime of intellectual property rights along with the paris convention and the bern convention now madrid agreement deals with the international registration of marks in other words you can say international protection of marks now since there was some procedure of international protection for patents as well as copyright the states in the international community felt a need that trademarks also must be protected at the international level and as a result the madrid agreement which deals with trademarks was concluded five years after the Berne Convention. Now, these three agreements together, even today, are set to cover the major principles of protection of the principal forms of intellectual property. Now, coming to the procedure under the Madrid Agreement for the protection of uh, trademarks, uh, sorry, registration of marks, Applications for international registration may be filed only by natural persons and or legal entities within a country, which is a party to the agreement or the protocol. The Madrid system of international registration cannot be used to protect a trademark outside the Madrid Union. So, these, the Madrid Union strictly follows the basic tenets or principles of international law. That is, protection of marks shall be granted only for uh, in convention countries non-convention countries mark shall not be protected on the territories of the convention countries an international registration can only be filed for a mark that has already been registered or where the international application is governed exclusively by the protocol if registration has been applied for in the office of origin there are three kinds of international applications that can be filed one is an international application governed exclusively by the agreement. This means that all the designations are made under the agreement. Secondly, an international application governed exclusively by the protocol. This means that all the designations are made under the protocol. And the third is an international application governed by both the agreement and the protocol. This means that some of the designations are made under the agreement and some are made under the protocol. So this is how three different applications can be filed under the Madrid Agreement or Madrid Convention for the protection of marks. Now an international application must be presented to the WIPO's International Bureau through the Office of Origin and must contain at least a reproduction of the mark which must be identical with that in the basic registration or basic application. So when a mark is being uh, protected 
on the territory of another country, the mark must be identical with that uh, with that mark which is submitted in the basic registration or basic application. That is the first registration for the protection of a mark, whatever the form of the mark, that same mark must be part of the applications while being filed on the territories of other countries. And a list of the goods and services for which protection is sought, classified in accordance with the international classification of goods and services, the NICE classification, the NICE agreement based on the NICE classification, because under that the schedules and under the schedules, the classification of goods are made. The WIPO convention is also an important uh, part of the international regime because uh, it is the most important organization. WIPO is World Intellectual Property Organization. It was signed in Stockholm in 1967, entered into force in 1970 and amended in 1979. Now, it is an intergovernmental organization and uh, it became one of the specialized agencies of the UN in the year 1974 under a special agreement that was signed by the WIPO and the United Nations. Now, the WIPO's two main objectives are firstly to promote the protection of intellectual property worldwide. Secondly, to ensure administrative cooperation among the intellectual property unions established by the treaties that WIPO administers. So these are the two main objectives. And then in order to attain these objectives, WIPO, in addition to performing the administrative tasks of the unions, undertakes a number of activities, including normative activities, then program activities, international classification and standardization activities and registration and filing activities. Now, all these works are undertaken by WIPO in order to achieve the above two goals which are set forth in the WIPO convention. Now, WIPO is the modern day international body dealing with the regulation of intellectual property. It became a formal part of the UN in 1974. The major focus and aim of WIPO can be enca encapsulated in the following. The establishment and development of the best intellectual property standards. Now, the aim of WIPO is to get its member nations to agree upon norms that are of high, high, as high a standard as possible which must also ideally be consistent and coherent. The development of a balanced and effective international intellectual property system that enables innovation and creativity for the benefit of all. So when we talk about the trade related aspects of WIPO, it has to be noted that unfortunately, international trade concerns and issues have never been the focus of WIPO. It has taken a backseat due to other agendas. So now, WIPO has realized that trade related aspects of intellectual property is also a very important component and plays a very important role. We are all aware of the TRIPS agreement, the most comprehensive agreement that has been signed in the world. The agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights is an international legal agreement between all the member nations of the World Trade Organization. So when it comes to trade and intellectual property, this is the most relevant and comprehensive agreement. It came into effect on 1st January 1995. The agreement contains minimum standards of protection in relation to intellectual property. That is the basic aim and goal of the TRIPS agreement to provide minimum standards of protection. And the TRIPS agreement also speaks of the principle of national treatment, which has been a part of the Paris Convention, a part of the Bern Convention, and now be, it has become a part of the uh, TRIPS agreement. And another important principle that the TRIPS agreement incorporates is the principle of most favored nation clause, MFN clause. Now, while the principle of national treatment 
is for individuals. The most favored nation clause is for states. That is where if one state is providing any concession, right, favor, privilege to another country, then under the MFN clause, the country is under an obligation to provide the same favor, right, privilege and concession to all other countries. In the sense, a country cannot discriminate among the countries. That is what the most favored nation clause speaks of. So while the national treatment is for individuals, F MFN clause is for states. And there is also a principle known as principle of minimum rights. Now, what is this principle of minimum rights? When we speak of principle of minimum rights, now the TIPS agreement lays down certain standards of protection of intellectual property. Now, most of the developed countries' protection within the domestic laws is certainly above the standards laid down by TIPS agreement. But there are certain countries whose IP protection is very weak and also fall below the standards laid down by TRIPS agreement. So what the TRIPS agreement says is that even those countries that have signed the TRIPS agreement must somehow raise their standards of protection and see that minimum protection is granted to the works or the intellectual properties of other nationals in the domestic territory. That is principle of minimum rights. Now it is, the TRIPS agreement is the most comprehensive multilateral agreement on intellectual property, which can be gauged by the varied intellectual property, whether it is copyright, trademarks, geographical indications, industrial designs, patents, layout designs of integrated circuits, and undisclosed information, which covers trade secrets and test data. Now, the TRIPS agreement was signed in 1994. There are two agreements that have been signed under the framework of WIPO. One is WCT, WIPO Copyright Treaty, and the other is WPPT, that is WIPO Producers of Phonograms Treaty. Now, these two treaties, which have been signed in 1996, uh, are a result of the technological developments that came up at that point of time uh, because of the internet and uh, the broadcasting of uh, programs. So that is why these two treaties are also called as internet treaties. In order to catch up with technology, the WIPO has been making efforts to uh, sign uh, treaties under its uh, framework to uh, what you say keep pace with the increases in technology now international trade and intellectual property rights are extremely important to the competitiveness of the various post-industrial economies the TRIPS agreement for the first time led to a worldwide agreement on the issues which intersect between intellectual property and trade now today intellectual property has become uh, uh, very significant and important because it intersects with international trade. And uh, if intellectual property is not protected properly, international trade will suffer. So that is why there is a very strong link between intellectual property protection and international trade. Intellectual property has finally been accepted as an area to which internationally recognized rules and disciplines apply. Protection and enforcement of these rights are critical to many global industries, including research-based pharmaceuticals, whose livelihood and ability to contribute to the world depend upon innovation. So if intellectual property is protected, people are prompted, they are encouraged to go for innovations because they know this, in spite of all their effort, if they come out with something new and if that is copied and uh, they lose uh, their intellectual property, then that zeal to create innovation is lost. 
So the stronger the protection of intellectual property, the greater the zeal to go for innovation. So that is why it is important to protect intellectual property. And it is not simply protection, but it should be strong and effective protection. Similarly, in the pharmaceutical industry also, this is again another industry which also must carry high front-end research and development expenses. So, however, there are so many countries with such ineffective drug protection that it becomes almost impossible to enter and sustain in those markets. Because many countries, since they cannot create a drug, a life-saving drug, they copy the formula and then produce it within the countries without taking uh, permission from the multinational company that has created the drug. In other words, they are actually infringing the patent right of the pharmaceutical company. But in certain countries it happens, so it becomes very difficult for the multinational companies to protect their pharmaceutical products on the territories of certain countries. Similarly, publication and protection. Inadequate protection of copyright leads to a definite chilling effect on publishers, producers, composers and authors who see their material infringed without repercussions. This is also applicable to retailers who end up losing a lot of valuables business to the pirates. Uh, in certain countries, creativity is killed because of piracy. Now, the threats of inadequate protection. Due to inadequate protection of intellectual property, such as trademarks in a number of countries, the fraudulent marketing of substandard and dangerous counterfeit items like automobile replacement parts, agricultural chemicals is encouraged. If proper protection is there, we will get original automobile parts and not fake automobile parts. The products and services that should be protected by intellectual property law account for a significant portion of trade and inadequate protection today plays a major distorting role in world trade. This is all the more troublesome at a time when trade imbalances are already threatening existing open marketplaces. And therefore, we can see that there is an intricate relationship between trade and intellectual property. Why intellectual property is important as far as international trade is concerned? because piracy in all forms must be curbed. Only then intellectual property can be protected because that is what prompts individuals to go for inventions, which I already spoke of. It fosters and rewards innovation. Intellectual property protection is crucial in fostering international trade. International trade refers to the exchange of goods and services across borders. This increasing exchange of goods across the world has led to the emergence of a virtual global market which comprises of almost all countries and survives on a robust trading system and friendly trade relations between nations. For obvious reasons, businesses are eager to tap into this market which has led to it becoming extremely competitive. So access to new markets has become easier now than it was than it ever was in order for business to survive in this cutthroat environment an extremely strong domestic and international regime for the protection of all kinds of intellectual property becomes very, very essential. Considering intellectual property while trading has many benefits. It ensures that you maintain exclusivity for your products and provides an opportunity to stop imitators. It also helps in avoiding infringement upon others' intellectual property Right. If that is done, this must be the last slide. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your lecture. And uh, thank you, uh, Dwarkana, sir, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I, I just have one or two comments to make, only to sum up. One is about the utility model, sir. As you know, you have already explained very well. It is for a lesser inventive step. Because if the degree of inventive step is lesser, then short-term or economic patents are granted in the form of utility models, as Sir rightly pointed out. If, if the novelty, utility, and non-obviousness 
in the strict sense are complied with, then they may go for patent. But if the knowledge is already there, but if it is an improvement over and above the existing knowledge, like uh, we are giving patent of addition in India, in some countries, in fact, separate uh, patents are granted like utility models. They call it second tire protection. The 2016 IPR policy also refers to that, but it has not considered it seriously. Second point, sir, mentioned very clearly about the patents, especially with regard to the public good. But uh, suppose somebody is claiming copyright and all. After this WCT and WPPT, provisions are incorporated in the form of 2012 amendment in the copyright law. There are provisions relating to technology protection measures and anti-circumvention measures. Therefore, under the copyright law also, they cannot be registered, virus or malware. That is the second one, sir. These are the only two interventions with the permission of my senior uh, professor, Professor Barakana, sir. Sir, uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank you on my personal behalf. And I also thank the participants for sparing their valuable time you know, almost about 100 participants have remained in on online, in online mode. And uh, I'm very sure that the, the purpose of organizing this lecture by the eminent international law professor is... Request uh, Mr. Srinivas Rao to please propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IPR chair. Uh, good evening, uh, sir. Good evening, IPR chair, uh, professor, Dr. G.B. Reddy Garadu, sir. Uh, good evening, organizing team and all the participants who have attended this meet. Uh, sir, you have briefly shared your ideas in such a way that it is understood even by a new learner as well. So I am sure that whoever the participants who are new to the subject might be feeling that the session like this, which is being organized by DPIIT Chair Osmania University is easy to understand. And which was the core idea of uh, starting and organizing these kind of events, sir? Usually it is noticed that uh, students fear of subjects like jurisprudence and uh, treaties. But today you have made this easy for everyone. So presentation was, was also with the jotted points which made the session more simpler. On behalf of my entire team of DPIIT IPR Chair of Osmania University, I would like to thank you for gracing this session, sir, for sharing your valuable information, knowledge, and expertise with the attending participants. And uh, that is what I can see in the comments which are floating in the chat and the participants are also admitting that your lecture was very simpler ever for them. Uh, with those comments and compliments, sir, I would also like to thank the IPR Chair Professor Dr. G.B. Reddy, sir, Dr. Irfan uh, Ali Abbas, Mr. Nagaraj, Ms. Vaishnavi for making things easier in organizing this event and constantly uh, working and coordinating results for the best teamwork. I would also like to thank the participants among which there are few eminent scholars who are also attending from far away locations, which is encouraging for us to bring out more and more sessions like this for everyone. Lastly, I would like to request everyone to kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get the updates and as and when it is being published uh, on the website. On behalf of DPIIT chair and the team, uh, I would like to wish everyone and their family members a very happy and prosperous new year uh, 2022 thank you sir thank you everyone thank you thank you